Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock on a Saturday. We hit Saturday, which means it's time for a talk magic. Now today, I have somebody that I'm going to be sitting down and chatting with, and I have probably had more people in the last year ask me to interview this gentleman than pretty much anyone else in the magic industry worldwide. And I've been wanting to interview him for a long time, but the problem is he's one of the busiest performers in magic. While a lot of people talk the talk, he's going out there and walking the walk and then some. He's incredibly successful at everything that he does, but he's also got a really interesting backstory. Super nice guy. I've been on stage with this person and I was blown away by the performance. Absolutely incredible. Super excited to bring him onto Magic TV. I am, of course, talking about the one and only James Phelan. How are you doing, mate? You okay? Yeah, really good. Yeah, when we were on stage together, it was it, like deceptively long ago. That must have been 2018, maybe. I, I, it was before that, I think. It was probably 2017. And I yeah. still remember the routine that you did. It was the it was the phone into the bucket of water that ended up in the melon. The watermelon, yeah. yeah. Melon. And I remember I'd ne I've heard of I'd heard of you at that point, but I'd never really seen you perform. And I just I was watching in the wings and I was watching the audience and I, I they were just literally hanging off their off your every word. The Thank whole you. routine was hilarious. The the water and the it was magical, it was funny, it was entertaining, and I became a fan right there. That like there were some great acts on that that gala show. Yeah. You know, uh Ken Dine was there, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, the, the highlight, I think that the best act of that night by far, by a country mile, uh, was you, yeah. without a doubt. I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it was early doors. I used to send, I used to send texts at theatres insane because I used to do a, a painting thing that I used to use glitter that involved me throwing glitter at a canvas on the stage. And when I say I got abuse... Uh, on my emails, loving abuse, but sincere from <laughs> theatre technicians going, it's been six months and I'm still finding glitter everywhere. <laughs> like there's this like um, tech industry magazine, uh, you know, as every industry has their magazines and it had a cartoon in it that was uh, a tech that had glitter and it was them trying to brush it off the stage and it was like all bleeped out, but it was like glitter. And then it was in the car on the way home glitter. And then it was in the shower on the way home glitter. And then I think it was like the, in, it, in its own funeral going, the glitter's still here. And then a theatre tech from Epsom sent me it going, just want you to know, this is what you put me through. But I remember doing that that day as well. Mm, yeah, you did. Yeah, it was. And it was... I was wearing Cuban heels at the time. I had a very prolific Cuban heel face for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> your your show i mean we're going to talk about everything that you do we're going to talk about your show we're going to talk about your magic we're going to talk about what you're doing because like i said to you off camera before we started rolling you genuinely are doing what every magician wishes they could do yeah which is touring your own show and yeah. selling out venues not small venues big venues selling them out no matter where you go and that takes a lot of work to get to that point and we're going to talk about that but before we do I want to start at the very beginning because just in case people don't know who you are, yeah. you've, had very, you've had a very interesting progression into magic. A lot of people, yeah. I ask them their, I ask them their, uh, their origin story and you know a lot of people have the same origin story. Yours is very different. So before we go anywhere, and for those people who don't necessarily know you as well as others, let's talk about your origin story and why it's so unique and let's talk about your journey into magic. So can you kind of tell me what happened, how you ended up as a magician and, and what that whole process looked like at the beginning. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, you don't really appreciate it at the time. Um, so my story is, so I am, so, so my mum is Debbie McGee's sister. Uh, so uh, I grew up watching, when I, when I was a baby, like when I was really, young i'd spend so much time with my auntie debbie and my uncle paul um and uh and i, I still speak to debbie every day like I, I i'm super close to debbie and so yeah we, i used to go to my nan's house and we would watch uh we'd have the magic show the paul daniels magic show uh on vhs tapes and so and i genuinely didn't know what it was so we used to have these tapes that had my uncle paul in and, but I never watched it 
you know, I, I assume it was probably Noel's house party in those days that would be the big Saturday night TV show. We never used to watch it in a sort of live, as it were, or at least I don't remember it. But we did used to watch the same handful of episodes over and over again. And I just didn't really, it was quite alien to me. Um, and also, like, you know, when you're a child, you don't really understand that this is a big budget TV show. <laughs> you know, you just you just appreciate what it is. And so uh, so I, I remember that. And I, I used to love watching that, as I'm sure everyone did. Um, but it was very much sort of just um, almost like a given. You know, if we were at my nan's for the weekend, I would or we'd watch it if we weren't watching Aladdin or The Lion King or whatever. It was just one of the things you'd watch. But I, I really vividly remember, and this is what the only part of this that I, and the only part of my career really that I think comes down to luck, is that when I was born, I was right in the sweet spot. So if I was born any older, if I was any older, my Uncle Paul would have been so famous that he, people, I would have got bullied at school or I would have wanted to avoid it. And my cousins are a bit like that. And if I was any younger, I wouldn't have got to see any of it. So I wouldn't have been swept up in it. So I was kind of in this place where I remember going to the the show, uh, as in the theatre show, and just being totally swept up in this atmosphere of the theatre. And my brother's two years younger than me. And I think he missed that. Um, but I would be going to see the show for when I was like two and a half. Um, and so I just fell in love with it completely. And it, and it was never, I think this is where my sort of background in magic is different to a lot of other uh, magicians in that, you know, I, I didn't fall in love with the magic for any reason other than just that sense of excitement that you get at a theatre. So I wasn't I wasn't one of those people that was reading about it before I was performing it or whatever. Like I was very much sort of uh, just immersed in it um, and not even so much the, the magic, but more the feeling that it creates, if that makes sense. Um, and so then I, I just I just knew what it was what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I remember I was younger, I would sort of piece together, like I'd, I'd make little TV shows out of Lego and stuff, because I was like, that's what I want to I want to be. But it was just it, it just didn't mean anything to me. And I, I and I really probably until I was 15, I had no appreciation for the fame or the success or, or whatever it was. And um, what happens is, you know, the, the magic show has been a gift to me in that I know so much, all the material that's in there is a huge amount of material over 20 years that I have seen at a handful of times. Um, but, and also I suppose because I was watching magic from when I was so young, I remember what I remember. So there's little moments, like most shows you go and see, whether it be anything, that if you go and see Michael McIntyre, you don't remember every gag that he told, but you remember the odd gag and you remember how it made you feel. And so now when I'm trying to think about material, I can remember kind of what st has stuck with me. And so I've tried to pepper that into the show as well. But I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, and so what happened was I just I started performing and and doing it. But I, I sort of I had a I did an economics degree or half of one and, you know, concentrated when I was at school and stuff. But I started putting on shows and I was like 13 or 14. And I think like for, for a lot of us, um, it was the reason for being noticed right is is we could do something that would get people interested in you and and at that point it kind of does a lot of the heavy lifting and the same when I was at university as well is you know it does a lot to sort of get you recognized by people or you know I used to get paid to go to university events that everyone else was paying for a ticket to I used to love that um and so that that's a very sort of shortened version of the journey but it's really interesting because I it's a bit of a gift and a curse really because people assume that I sat down with my uncle paul and he taught me everything whereas he never really taught me anything really the, that, that was what i was going to ask you yeah yeah i know i mean if the papers ask i always say yeah everything but i not i mean i remember one day saying to him i want to you did this trick on your tv show how do you do it and he went it's in that book go and read it and and i think that was a choice i'm not that i didn't read it but i think that was a choice for him i think he wanted me to read it um so you know people assume that but i also think I could, I would never be able to pull off any of my Uncle Paul's material, uh, particularly with this accent versus his. And, you know, if I, I went on stage and did a chop club and an egg, lemon and walnut, as, you know, everyone else has since done, I'm sure, uh, I just, I wouldn't be able to pull it off. I just, I mm. couldn't do it. Um, 
so the uh, the gift it it gave me in that sense was just knowing it was possible and and just sort of the normalization of if you see someone on telly uh and that's the only exposure you see to them it's kind of this uh, it's this sort of impossible thing you know i remember andy nyman talking about uh, in an interview where he was talking about well, when he was first in films and before he was in films it just felt so f- out of reach for him until he was in it and then it's it, once he did the first one then he realized he did the second one and I think that's kind of what that did for me is that the the sort of the juxtaposition of the the showbiz stuff and the sitting at home drinking a cup of tea and having your breakfast were married so I could see that if I wanted to do that I could do it so I just, just never had any doubt on and sort of, of how to do it and then I, I just sort of you know run forward with it since then really and that's kind of the story is i just fell in love with it from watching my uncle paul's tv show and theater and then wanted to do it so a couple of questions the first question is you did the economics degree mm. was there a reason you actually went to university to do that degree because you, you say hey i know i could do it i saw my uncle paul do it yeah you started doing shows at the age of 15 what made you kind of go well i'm going to go to university and spend three years doing this rather than you know what? School couldn't finish early enough. I'm going to go out, get some business cards, and I'm going to go out and follow in, you know, Paul's footsteps in terms of going and make a career doing this. Yeah, it's really interesting that, uh, and there's probably quite a lot in it because, you know, my my granddad, as in Debbie's dad, was a very. He came from Northern Ireland, just the most wonderful human being in the whole world. And a lot of my my humour and personality on stage and stuff is as much that as it is anything to do with Monkey Paul. But he was very risk averse. You know, he used to when he when he was working, he had a corner shop and you know, very much of the era of save your pension and then retire at 60 and, you know, look after the grandkid. And so it actually it surprises me that, you know, he let Debbie go to the Royal Ballet School, for example, you know. Um, but he when I was younger, he would always say, uh, look after, like, do your exams, basically, uh, and concentrate on them. And it was interesting. And also my, you know, my dad, my dad came from a, a lot of brothers and sisters. He had, he has eight brothers and sisters. And so he was very uh, sort of um, like, it was very, I mean, he's a smart person, my dad as well. So he was always very, you've got to work hard um, or we'll make you move school, basically. We'll pull you out of school. Um, whereas my mum was kind of, my mum and still is just this powerhouse of, She's like my mum's four foot ten, little petite blonde thing, but it's just full of inspiration always and just a wonderful human being. Um, so I, I kind of had that, but I, because of my mum, I always kind of knew I could do whatever I wanted as well. Like she always used to say that to me when I was growing up. But I had in my in the back of my head that you need to study for exams and do what you're supposed to do effectively. And when I got a bit older, when I probably got to sixteen my granddad said I don't know why you're not doing more magic you'd be making you, you know you could be making a living from it kind of thing and I was very risk averse then but I also think when you're sort of 15 16 maybe even a bit older and certainly older for me you don't have but I don't know what I know now you know if I if I could make that choice now I would go why am I doing a physics a level like do a drama a level and then go to drama school like why why would I not do that but in those days you don't really have you don't know like I don't know I just, so I just kind of chose the best choice um and then I did economics at a level which I really enjoyed and I really liked and I, I did uh you know I got quite good marks with and then I googled degrees that make the most money and at the top was economics and I went I'm gonna do that and within four days I knew I didn't want to be there and I didn't want to do it um but I, I stayed with it for a while but I really, the, the thing that was super useful about university for me was I went, I did student radio and I did, I just fell in love with magic completely. And also like I had, uh, I, I sort of found myself a bit, you know, I started exercising properly and group of friends and all those sorts of things. And so I just, I just, all of a sudden, like where I am now is a direct response of going to university, even though it's not from doing the economics degree. It does mean, though, that all my housemates from university are all econ- like economists or accountants, and they have no idea what I do for a living at all, and vice versa. Um, but that was why, really, it was just kind of just you don't really know, and you kind of you make the best the best sort of choice you can at the time. And I was just in an environment where it was always 
do your exams, have something to fall back on, as I'm sure we've all heard. Um, and I also just think it's a complete false economy. I think it's nonsense. Mm. You know, I think, you know, it's the, the skill set is like you don't you're not paid for your time, really. You're paid for your skill and you're paid for your audience. And and that's what it is. You know, the you there's different there's different layers of of how you can earn a living. And the first one is you charge by the hour to do something that anyone can do. And then you're relatively low paid. And then you you know how to do something that someone else can't do. And then you get paid more than them because someone else can't do it. And then you have an audience yourself and then they pay you and then the sky's the limit. And that that's, you know, I just, I, so I just, it was really interesting. You know, when people say get a proper job, you go, yeah, but you mm -hmm. like, uh, and they go, well, do you not want the stability? You go, yeah, but you can get sacked. I can't. <laughs> you know, I may have a bad week where I can't earn any money, but also I do get to sleep until midday sometimes. So it's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And and before we carry on and talk more about where you uh, what you did, one other question. Everything that you've said up until this point is about magic shows. Mm. And obviously the influence that you might have had watching Paul's material is... 95% of what you saw him do was on stage. Yeah. And we know you now as a stage performer predominantly. Yeah. Most people that come into magic, that's not the case, especially yeah. in the 90s. It was, it's close up magic. And oh, I want to be, you know, doing close up. I want to get a restaurant booking. I want to do this. Did, did, did you ever kind of focus on close up magic? Or was it because of all the various influences that you had around you, you were always thinking about performing on stage? Um, I, I did close up. Uh, I've, I've kind of stopped maybe the last couple of years. What's really interesting though about that when you said that is, you know, I, if you think about the TV show, other than the big stuff, you know, whether it be in the, the illusions or the out of, uh, out studio stuff, it is all close up really, you know, TV is really good for close up. Like the TV is a close up medium, really. Um, you know, if you're doing a stage show, it's, the, it's why I think, uh, you know, the X Factor stopped working when they started putting it in big arenas is because you're watching an audience watch something rather than watching something yourself. So I think TV is inherently, you know, quite a close up thing. Um, and I, 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 I did it uh, for a, for a while. Um, I just, I don't think I ever loved it. And, and that's not, no, I, I don't even think that's true. I did love it, but I didn't love the sort of and I'm sure we've all had it you know when you're tired and you've had a busy week of work where it's Christmas and you've done three booking I didn't like that I had to sort of find the energy to then go and interrupt people and also you get people that just don't want you there <laughs> like yeah it's it's like yeah I know I, I know what I'm doing like I just trust me because I'm going to impress you in a second um and so I, I did quite a lot of it for a while but uh it was never where it was kind of never what I really wanted to do. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing I loved about close up is I love the people and I, I still love the people. And that's all it's all about, really. But also, you know, walking around someone's Christmas party for two hours and then not have it. I don't know. I just it just didn't it didn't fill me with the same feeling. Um, and so, you know, and I, and I, I watched some guys, you know, I did a I did a thing for um uh gary schiffman um who does the magic for watford football club um i really hope it is watford because if i've said it with the wrong football club i'm gonna get tortured but i did a thing for him and there was me and him and then etienne and uh catherine um his name surname i forget and, Rose, like, maybe yeah no the other one um Oh, I know. Yes. Oh, we had a TV show for a while. Yes, yes. I can't remember. But anyway, and they were just amazing at it. And the the tables are erupting at Etienne, and I'm just going, oh yeah. But if I, I like, I just I I don't love it as much as he loves it. You yeah. Know? Um. And so that's kind of why, really. Wow, fantastic. So, you get to the point where you've done university. You're finished with university. Do you immediately launch into a career as a magician? And if you do, what's your plan? Because obviously I, I, I get a lot of questions on this channel. How do I go and become a full-time magician? Now you've obviously, you said you started doing shows at the age of 15, but did you have, we talked at the very beginning of this interview about how you're now selling out 
you know, a touring show, which very few people get a chance to do. Was that the ultimate goal? What was the plan coming out of university? You go, hey, I want to be a magician. I'm going to be a magician. Where where do you go to make this happen? What was your what was your plan? What did you end up doing? Yeah, it's a bit of a blur, really, because I remember talking about the idea of a theatre show when I was 20, 21, maybe. But the idea originally was a YouTube channel. Um, and for a whole host of reasons, uh, it didn't happen. Um, and I, I basically I came out of university having done magic. I got a job at a nightclub doing magic at, in Southampton. There's a few other people. Uh, Stephen Simmons did it, and a guy called Sam Howard, who you might know, did it. But like Stephen did it after me, and Sam did it before me. But it's it that was a really fascinating environment because everyone is you can barely hear, and everyone's really drunk, and it's really good learning how to manage people in that way. Um, so I started to do that, and it was quite nice because I've never been a massive sort of you know night out kind of person. I'm not a massive partier, so it would give me an excuse to go to work and still be in the environment without you know feeling like I needed to go get hammered and fall over um so I, I did that when I was at university um and then I I came home and I got a job do, in marketing basically um and I really loved it and I was uh, you know I I was good at it but I was only good at it because my brain was thinking about the magic because you go, oh, if I did this for me, or oh, maybe this would work for the client, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I, I did. I mean, I, I had a nice time. But I remember saying to the CFO that I was like, it's just like it's the second on the list of what I want to do. So I used to have a notebook and I'd be sat at the desk and something would come to me and I'd write down an idea and I have these notebooks of ideas of the stuff to do with the magic. Um, or someone would mention something or I'd have a meeting with the son about some you know car campaign and i'd go oh this would be a good idea for this or whatever uh and i remember listening to an interview and it might have been with sarah millican or someone like that but talking about leaving your full-time job and they said it will never feel comfortable like don't wait for the perfect time because that time will never come it's never going to feel comfortable to go goodbye to a full-time salary and so that was kind of ringing in my ears a little bit and then what happened was uh, I turned up to the audition for Britain's Got Talent, uh, just genuine sort of one of the rock up, like the real auditions, the one that no one ever gets through from. And uh, I had an idea of what I was going to do. And this was December 2019. No, 2015. December 2015. Okay. Uh, it was the year before my uncle Paul died. Uh, and I remember turning up and there was three magicians there and all of the, and four including me, and all of us had planned to do this, this same trick. Oh, wow. And uh, I was like, ah, oh, okay. And I remember going, I I, I was going to, I decided to do a cards across routine, uh, which I still do in the show. And because it was just the thing that I knew better is what I used to do when I was a, a nightclub. Like I used to do it every day. It's my favorite routine. You could play the whole room. You could play really small, really big, whatever. And I thought, well, I'm just going to throw in the bin this thing I've had prepared and do a, do something that I know no one else is doing. And I remember ringing my uncle Paul, who's still who's a bit poorly already at that point, and we kind of didn't really know why. And and he kind of it took him a while to understand what I was saying because his brain wasn't really there. And I'm going, and I said to him, I'm at this audition, and other people are doing it, and uh, I'm going to just riff it, and I'm just going to do a cards across routine. And he said something like, why would you do something that anyone else is doing or something like that? Or like, why are you looking at what other people are doing? And I was like, fine, I'm going to do it. And I, I walked in and I faced the wrong way in the audition. And then like, I walked in, faced the wrong way. And I was like, oh, there you are. <laughs> and we had a bit, and it was really nice. And then so what happened was they, they liked that and they gave me an, an audition date. And um, I was still working. So I took two days off work. The first day I rehearsed and the second day I went to the Dominion and did this Brits with Talent audition, which went really, really super well. And uh, the problem was, and no one knows this actually, I don't think I've ever said this publicly. So here's what happens is we film it. A week later, you go and they do the reveal. And I came out of the high of the reveal of whether or not you've got through. 
and I like, and they were like, yeah, you did very really well. We went to the hotel and rung Debbie, and that was they went. And my auntie goes, hey, Uncle Paul's got a brain tumor. The set that day, I came literally out of the audition for Britain's Got Talent to a hotel. I rung my auntie, and went just checking in, how is he? And he goes, she goes, this is what it is. And so all that means is all the stuff like I did stuff with Stephen Mulhern. Uh, where he was taking the mic, he was like, oh, let's just, re-. and he was taking the mic, being like, ha ha, like, that's magic, you know, and I'm knowing that he's in a hospital bed, but I can't talk about it, because you don't want the press to find out about it, and so all of that stuff, it can't be shown anyway, so all of that stuff goes in the bin, um, but thankfully, uh, the Radio Times broke their embargo, so what that means is, they, when you're at the audition, they get all of the journalists to come and interview you, and they go, you're not allowed to release this until he gets it broadcast. But they've got the 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 uh, the interviews already there. And someone at the Radio Times made the decision that it may be in a mistake that they're going to write that I'm doing this. I'm doing it. Uh, so all that means is all the other newspapers can then go according to the Radio Times, write about it, and not break their embargoes. Uh, in the interme- intervening time. I'd said to the people I work for, I said, my uncle Paul's not very well. I need to take some time off to spend some time with my family. And they said, you can't do that. And I remember going into work and they said, if he died, what would you get? Three days off? Like you get compassionate leaves three days. And I went, not for me. This is not for me. And I went home and I wrote my resignation. I remember sending a very stroppy email going, if you make me choose between the job and the family, the family's always going to win, is what I said. And then I wrote in a resignation letter and I sent him an email and said, I need you to meet me, as in my boss, I need you to meet me tomorrow. And I went, there's the resignation letter. And uh, I, I have done this ever since then. But I, before I did that, I took out a personal loan. I don't know why I'm going to tell you, this is deep, but I'll tell you all this. I took out a personal loan because I was like, I, I'll, put that in the, I'll put that in the bank because then I know if I don't get any work in, I can survive until I get another job. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and yeah, and then and then so I started doing that. And what happened was because I'd been doing lots of corporate clients I, with the marketing, I knew how to communicate with corporate people more than anyone else. And I just I knew that you know you can sell to one person at a corporate, um, and you know when I was working for the marketing agency, it was for stupid money. Whereas I, you know, either way, if you sell a ticket, it's a tenner. If you sell to one corporate client, it's a grand or whatever. Yeah. So I just I started focusing on doing um, trade shows. And uh, a sort of a close up of trade shows and pulling people in and and those sorts of things. And my the, the goal with that was like, if I did one a month, it pays my bills. Um, so I started doing that. But because of all the press that had come from the Britain's Got Talent stuff, I had this sort of almost like book of press cuttings of people just blowing smoke on my backside. Wow. And then my uncle Paul passed away. And because he passed away, it was top of the news agenda and so then you know they were doing press junkets for britain's got talent and asking the judges about me because they go we've heard he's doing it he's doing and i knew at that point it couldn't be shown and they knew at that point it couldn't be shown but they didn't want to go oh no we've cut him because it just looks really crass so Mm -hmm. they they were just they were said some really wonderful things about me and i'm I'm forever grateful you know amanda said some really lovely stuff about it when my uncle paul died it was just really lovely um but then I had that almost in my black book that I could then start to leverage that to get, you know, theatres effectively. Um, and, you know, I was at the first three years of doing it, I was selling like 30 seats. Like I, was, I remember doing Cranley Arts Centre, which is a hundred seats of venue and selling like 25. Um, now, and you know, you'll know, Craig, anyone that's a professional magician knows that the small shows are as good as the big shows mm-hmm. in every way, except financially. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, there, therein lies the problem, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. And also theatres don't want you back. You know, if I, you get there's theatres that still won't book me now because I mean, I, I do the old rep in Birmingham is a lovely venue. I, I had such a lovely time there. But when I was there, I sold 50 in a 400 seater and that was 2018. And now they won't ever book me again because they go, yeah, we're not going to take the risk. Despite, you know, now going, no, but look. Um, mm. And and so you that, that was kind of uh, the trouble for a while. And you just kind of have to hold your nose and hope you start to build an audience um and and that was kind of it really that that was the genesis of it um and i you know i wouldn't have i wouldn't have ever had the confidence to take the leap without my uncle paul passing away um and 
you just kind of you also kind of realize life's too short i suppose you know and also we're here for a minute like what's the worst that's going to happen you know well i mean it's a big risk uh, yeah. grilling theaters you know the easy way with the profile that you had and the profile you had from britain's got talent is just to go right corporates and just sit yeah. down and 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 do a ton of corporate gigs, a load of close-up stuff, but it's it's amazing that you were like, no, that's not what I want to do. I want yeah. to do this. It's going to require a lot of hard work. It's going to be more of a risk, but ultimately, that's where I want to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish it was more um, sort of thought through than that, but it, it it was purely because I if I did, if I went for corporates, I didn't really know how to get them. And, and, and I just... Yeah, I didn't know. And also I was like, is it all going to be in December? Like, I don't really, I didn't really know. And so I just didn't really have any idea how to do it. So I just kind of did what I knew really. And I, I spent a long time, like I, I've kind of played it down, but I spent a long time working on that and studying that and, you know, studying how to communicate with those sorts of people and build relationships with those sorts of people. And all of the press from the, the newspapers came primarily because when I knew I was doing Britain's Got Talent, I sent all the t TV editors an email and said, let's go for lunch. And then I took them all out for lunch. So then when it went, what ended up happening, which is why I'm sure Richard Jade still loathes me because it was the year he won, is when I got cut, I was getting three quarters of a page and he was getting a quarter of a page, but it's only because I'd gone and wind and dined them. And mm. then, and so they were invested in it. Um, and, uh, and and so it was all very it was a lot more planned than I've I've made it sound. But it's it, it took a long time of, you know, that the hardest thing with this and anything in this sort of business is is the brain power more than the action. It's the thinking about it and, and sort of working out how to do stuff. The doing it is is the easy bit, really. Um, you know, it's the same thing with, you know, with anything actually. It's it's just it's what works for one person doesn't work for someone else either. You know. Mm. Absolutely. And how did you develop your style? Because you said uh, right at the beginning of the interview, the way that Paul did things is not the way that you would do things. Yeah. You know, it, it just wouldn't work for you. Would you describe yourself? How would you describe your show? And how did you get to the point that you developed your character, um, you know, on stage? I uh, I just went on and just I, I'm <laughs> I'm one of those people, Craig, that I make much more sense on stage than I do off stage. <laughs> like, as I said to you before, the Cuban heels, they did not make sense off stage, but on stage, great. Um, and so I just kind of went on and was myself, really. And, you know, that has the benefit of if they like you and you're not performing, you're just being yourself. Um, if it goes wrong, they don't really care. And you don't, it doesn't mean that it ever does go wrong and that you'd come off stage and go, that was a success. But it does mean that when you go on stage, you have confidence that yourself is enough. That if the magic goes wrong, I'll just go. Like, I mean, this happened last night. I do a Malini um, ice production in the show uh, under a hat. And I had this guy on stage. His name was Jake. And he seemed like a very nice, normal human being, but he was chaotic as hell. And he... Uh, halfway through the routine lifted the hat up and put it on his head and so I went you've ruined the end of the show Jake just so you know <laughs> and uh but we made this whole thing out of it it was really funny and he was going like he was a really funny guy and if you've seen that Gordon Ramsay meme where he's like I'm an idiot sandwich this guy mm -hmm. Jake was going, I'm an idiot sandwich but all that meant was I just went I think I said something like there's like a few hundred of us in here. If we don't tell anyone, no one's going to know. Do you know what I mean? But I, that was kind of after I'd earned it back. But I, so I end up just pivoting to doing just some of my old material that I could just go, I go, this is like this. And it just, it works because you've got the flexibility to not be tied in. That's not necessarily the right way of doing it. I don't have any music in my show. I don't have it overly scripted. It's very loose. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I have had people that are far more experienced and far more intelligent than me come to my show and I'm fairly sure pull their hair out. Um, but uh, for me, it just, I, I just thought that was the most authentic, authentic thing I can do. Um, and also, you know, the other, the biggest constraint for me, Craig, if I'm being completely honest with you is I'm doing 250 shows a year in theatres that have varying degrees of lighting and staging and more importantly quality of technician and varying degrees of distance from my house 
And so I had to create something that was sustainable that it, I can go in if I'm exhausted and I'm running on nothing but caffeine and adrenaline, I can still do the show. And equally, yeah. um, you know, it, it, like it, it still works. Like I'm not sacrificing anything for it. And so that was a lot of it as well is I just, I wanted to just be me. And then it, it becomes then, you know, I've had breakups in the wings, genuinely. Uh, but then you go on stage and then the, the stage becomes your piece because you just, I feel myself when I come back because I've just been myself to 400 st strangers. And then that doesn't matter, you know. Mm. Wow. And how often do you change the show around? Because obviously you're constantly touring around the UK. Yeah. So you go back to theatres that you've been to before. Probably you're building a, a, an audience. Obviously new people are seeing you every time, yeah. but you do have a lot of people that come back because they love your show. And, you know, we've all seen the clips online of you standing there with a standing ovation and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and they... so, you know, people come back again and again. Do you, do you feel the need to constantly change the show? And is that a difficult thing to do? Yeah, uh, I think you you can't sell out a show without people coming back. I don't think you know my my audience is probably fifty percent returners and and fifty percent newcomers kind of thing. Uh, and what will happen is I, there'll be a couple that come and they enjoy it, and then next time they bring six people. That's kind of what it seems to happen. Um, and I, I think I you know I guess that's a benefit of the show being loose is they know that it's not going to be the exact same next time, so they're a little bit less resistant to booking a second ticket. But there's a there's a, a Jerry Seinfeld quote about him he calls himself general motors and what he does is at the end of the year he'll sack the worst 10 percent and put in loose stuff in and so that's kind of and it's not every year but that's kind of what i do is I'm, I'm kind of constantly writing and if i write something that's better and better doesn't necessarily mean uh the magic's better although that is a consideration it's also fits the place in the show better and the show overall. So I, for a long time, had wiki tests in the show and I, I resisted keeping it in because I think it's amazing. And I think Mark is a genius. I, I have so much respect for that human being. And he works far harder than me in every sense. He goes on that Facebook group and answers queries personally. And I just have a huge amount of respect for him. Uh, but I was aware that a million other magicians were doing it. And I thought, but well, the problem with that is I used to do that as the second routine in the show. And I wanted the visuals of having getting one person out of the audience at the back, put them on the stage and then put me at the back of the auditorium, because then in terms of the feeling of the room, I'm shoving them on stage. And there is no way anyone in that auditorium can't be immersed in the show because I'm behind them and they're looking in front of them. And so I, I just didn't for a long time have anything like I came up with, you know, other material that would have been more unique and, you know, whatever. Um but it just wouldn't fit that place well enough. Um, and now I've worked that out. But uh, that's kind of what it is. It's like, I'm always writing. And uh, just to, for an insight into a creative process. So what happens is I find it really difficult to sit down and write ideas. I find it really difficult to put time aside to do any, any sort of thing like that, really. But what will happen is I will be driving in the car and I'll have an idea or I'll see something. Or famously, I remember talking to Barry Murray about my Uncle Paul's domino escape, which I never found out how it was done until like long after he passed away um but that came from barry saying well we, i was sat watching the great escape and saw them crawling out and how they got out without being seen and that gave me the idea for the method for the domino escape and then that's where the domino escape came from and so it'll be something like that is i'll see an advert for a you know a galaxy phone i don't know why that is one that was an idea i had about <laughs> 10 years ago but i saw it and it would it comes up with an idea for a phone and then you and you write it down and then so what happens is whenever i, I start to piece the piece a new show together you, i just basically start to write the ideas down wow, and yeah. i mean that's that <laughs> page is sort of two weeks old so that's kind of the rate but then what happens is if i go to write the show i just go through and i've got 200 ideas that i go there's something in that that one is useless i have no idea what i was trying to say with that one. Oh, that's a good one that's a good one that's a good one and then you can kind you've got the building blocks ready to go so when you piece the show together i've got all the material there uh not in any way other than you know whereas if i wanted to sit down and come up with 200 ideas they're not going to be as diverse as that and i just wouldn't be able to do it i don't think um, and that's kind of the process really and then you, you kind of piece it together with the new show which is that it's called the dreamer there's a lot of brand new stuff but you, i, I want to keep in some of the old stuff just because you need I, I, like stuff is is bankable, you know, yeah. you know, I, I've, I had a tossed out deck in my show until two weeks ago. 
And I've done that routine since I first started in like 2016. And I never thought I would get rid of it because it was so good at grabbing the audience by the scruff of the neck and going, I'm in control and I'm the boss and you're going to enjoy yourself. And I put something in there. I got basically I, I had to go back to a theatre. I've done the Redgrave in Bristol six times this year, sold it out six times. And the theatre manager goes, James, you can come back, but we need a new show now. <laughs> and I went, OK. So I said, I'll write a new show and didn't really give it much thought. So I just kind of pulled this stuff together. And I opened that show with a routine that was just so much better in terms of the method wasn't better and the magic wasn't better, but how the audience responded to it was better. And I can go and I, and it's a lot more sort of dynamic in there. You play on the audience, you get to live a lot better. And so all of a sudden that, that tossed out deck's gone. <laughs> but obviously, you know, the benefit of that is, sorry if I'm rambling the other way, Craig, shut me no, up. No, you're not. This is uh, fascinating. You're not <laughs> rambling at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's, you know, I also know that I've got the tossed out deck there and, uh, if anything ever goes wrong, it's there now. And it's the same thing with Wiki Test is if I ever, if I'm ever stuck, you know, I've got a routine on my phone where from the, from the uh, 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 watermelon that I can do impromptu that I haven't used at all. But the other day I did something that went wrong and that was, a, that was the get out. So I just went and I did. And so you kind of, all the old material becomes the backup stuff. Um, and, and that's kind of how it works, really. That's kind of how, how I work anyway. Wow. I, 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 one more question about the show that you do. I found it really interesting when you said, hey, I don't really have much music in my show. Almost everyone I've spoken to, from a, a, a show director's point of view, they just spend so long talking about musicality. Mm. Was that done on purpose? Was that done for a reason? And what was what was the purpose behind that decision? Um, it wasn't done on purpose. It was done because I didn't know how to do it. Okay. Uh but then I tried to do it and it just made it all seem really contrived. And I had a director look at the show and come to the show. And he said, you can't start having, you can't start bringing the tabs in and have stage hands come on and off and reset the stage because it loses the charm of what the show is. And so I do this, I have this card table thing. And I, I resisted having any close up in the show at all for a long time. And I, I, I do a bit now, but it's not really close up. I, you know, as I said, I do the cards across and I do a really nice card to wallet routine, which I'm just, it's the thing that I love so much because it's got so much sort of, I don't know, I don't know, brass balls in it, really. I throw the wallet into the audience. Excuse me, I leave it with them. So I really like it. Um, but I, I, I wanted that to be, I, I remembered watching Penn and Teller's routine with Penn playing the bass or whatever his uh, instrument is. I can't remember what the big instrument is that he plays. Cello. Double bass, I think it is. Isn't yeah, it's a double bass maybe. And he's telling a story and Teller is there doing some stuff with cards that stuck to his hand and whatever. And the music behind it really lifts that. It's like dun, 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 dun. And I, I I really liked that as a as an idea as a set piece, and I thought well, maybe I could I didn't want to do that but I thought maybe I could put this in and have it a bit like a jazz bar, and have a bit of jazz music underscoring it and it'd be nice, um, and it just it just didn't work it just seemed a bit too shoehorned in really, and I I think there is a place for it completely. Most magicians, it lifts their show massively. But I think if you put music under McIntyre's show, maybe, or what I know that's not magic, but just as an example, it would distract from it. And and I think that's kind of where my show's found itself, but that's not on purpose. You know, Paul Keith came to my show and he said, it's really interesting. You haven't got any magic, uh, you haven't got any music in the show. And I went, yeah. And I, and I, I tried after that, because I think Paul's a genius. And I tried after that and I just couldn't make it work at all. So that's why I don't. Um, and and also, you know, as I say, if you're going in for one night stands, it's harder to get that stuff right because yeah. I think you can miss lighting cues and no one notices. I think if you miss a sound cue, everyone notices. And I my show for a long time was with two cues, well, three cues, entrance, exit, camera, if I used the camera. And every show they'd miss the exit cue. And I'd walk off in silence. And then as I was in the wings, I'd hear the music playing. It's like you had one job. And so 
I, it's harder to sort of test it and get it right when you're relying on other people. You know, I've kind of worked around a lot of that stuff now with, you know, my my team and, and those sorts of things. But it's still, it's it, it kind of, you go to these venues and you have no idea what you're going to be confronted with. And that's the most stressful bit, you know, the most exhausting bit. It's also really interesting talking to people that don't perform who just assume you turn up at seven o'clock for a half seven show. And you go, no, no, I'm here since midday. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it's really fascinating. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, the uh, You mentioned a couple of times about, uh, you know, hey, this didn't work, so I took it out, or this didn't work, so I took it out. How, what, this is a kind of a, a question I'd love to know the answer to. Mm. How, when do you know, like how much time, did, so you've put, you've spent time and effort putting together a new piece for the show. You're excited about it. You try it out. It doesn't hit like you hope it does. At what how long do you give it what's the process that you go through do you tinker with it or do you just go the people you know. buying tickets for this i need to take it out straight away like what's the what's the process there? yeah i'm quite brutal with it. I, I i think you know um so i did i'll give you an example there's, there's three things that happen it's either you either know it's not going to work it works for me immediately like that thing that i've replaced the tossed out deck with and you go i don't need to touch it let's do that forever or you go this is good but it needs work and i i think you know with magic the bar is quite low right in that people love magic and are um impressed with it even if it doesn't go overly smoothly mm. you know you can do something averagely well and people go how do you do that and and so I can, what would happen is I will come, I'll come off stage and I won't be happy with it, but the audience would have reacted positively. And then I go, right, no, I need to work on that. Mm. Um, and my show in Edinburgh last year was, I, I did two shows. I did last year's show, which was all brand new stuff. No, complete opposite of that. The last year's show, which was all stuff that I knew back to front and a new show that was all brand new stuff. And at the beginning of the run, I loved doing the old stuff and hated doing the new stuff because I just didn't know it. And I knew there was lots of seeds of ideas, but it wasn't that good. And then by the end, in fact, by a week in, it was the opposite. I was loathing doing the old stuff because I was loving doing the new stuff so much. But immediately, you know what's going to work. You know, I did a thing where I have I had conf like confetti cannons over the audience that were playing cards. And I would get someone to think of a playing card and I'd do a few reveals and then the confetti would come out and it would blow over the audience and it would all be the, whatever card it was it was chosen. And... I've seen people do that. I saw someone do, do something similar in Vegas. I think Shin does something. Mm -hmm. And But I mean, I was like, this just doesn't work. And so I got rid of that immediately, having spent a fortune on confetti blowers and branded confetti. Um, but then you, you start to do other stuff. And I go, yeah, that clicks. So what will happen is it will take me, either stuff will be amazing immediately, I'll get rid of it immediately, or it will take me 20 shows to get it right. Yeah. Yeah, so I go, yeah, that's the one. Question for you. You've got such a high profile. Uh, you talked about going on Britain's Got Talent and that never happened for a variety of different reasons. Mm. Have you ever pushed for TV work because that would help your profile in terms of selling shows? Or do you kind of think the selling without going on TV, yeah. I prefer a live audience. Like, is, is, was the, and, and what made you decide to go on Britain's Got Talent in the first place? Like, what, it, 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 can we talk a little bit about TV for yeah, you? Absolutely. Especially, obviously, you know, you grew up, we talked about you growing up seeing Paul on TV all the time and seeing the, the videos of him over the previous years. So I have lots of theories about all of this. So the Ida Britain's got talent because I needed to do something. Um, and I was like, it's like, a, that will snap it. Like that will be a huge positive action that has an immediate result done i've made the decision the ball is moving i'm moving in the right, right direction so that's kind of why i did it um i just i for a long time i would have loved to have done tv and i didn't pursue it because i didn't know what i was doing in terms of i wanted to be good at the magic before too many people saw the magic mm. if that makes sense you know i didn't want to go on tv it'd be underwhelming and then people never talk excuse me never talk about it again as i'm you know there's, that happens with everything you know there's people that go on live at the apollo i talk a lot about comedians and i don't know why that is um but i guess it's because it's a 
universal reference point but a lot of people go on live at the apollo and you never hear from them again and a lot of people go on live at the apollo and become jack whitehall or whatever you know and i i didn't want to be in the former category if i got an opportunity like that i wanted to be good at it and i wanted it to make an impact um whereas now i just think tv isn't what it was so here's here's my theory in the 80s or the 90s or 15 20 years ago you would go on tv and tv would give you the audience so i would be mr nobody i would go on uh tv with my magic show and then all of a sudden i'm wayne dobson or whatever wayne dobson or michael paul or you know yuri or whatever because tv had its audience whereas there is no such thing in my th- in my thought process of broadcasting as it was it's very much narrow casting in that you can't put something out and 15 million people see it anymore unless you have the audience already so what happens is you're not getting on tv and getting an audience you're having an audience and then getting on tv mm-hmm. that's kind of what i think which then goes what's the point of doing telly do you know what i mean I do mm. I do the same theatres as people that have been on Mock the Week or whatever. And like, you know, I, I did a did the same theatre as Gareth Gates a, a day before him and he sold a third of what I'd sold. And you just think, well, what's the like there's no money in it either, so why? You know? And I I I, I would do it, but I would do the right stuff. If someone rung me up and said, Do you want to do I'm a celebrity? I'd go, yes. <laughs> or they go, We want you to we want you to host something where you interview people i'll do that because i just love doing it but other than that i just think i don't don't, i'm not gonna i've got no real desire for doing tv tv sake it's the same reason i don't do pr so much anymore there is a huge benefit to pr but i don't really do a huge amount particularly for the venue for the theaters because it doesn't sell any tickets it doesn't do anything Mm. you know it's a vanity exercise you know you know like if you i get in a local newspaper to say that my show is at Norden Farm in Maidenhead, no one's going to read it. The only person that's going to read it is going to be me, realistically, and the, pers- the person that wrote the piece. And so it's a similar thought process to that, is that I I, I also crave, if I'm honest with you, I, I realised that the growth in anything is exponential. So I'm not, I didn't want to dilute where my focus was. In that, like, if everything grows like that, and if I'm doing lots of things, you're only there. Whereas to get to here, you need to be doing one thing for a long time, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then yeah. sidestep. That that that's kind of the plan. And so if it comes, it comes. Um, I don't think it will happen in the next two years, um, because the way that my career plan is laid out, unless something, unless I get a phone call and someone says, "Can you do this?" I'm not going to pursue it in that time frame, if that makes sense. That said, though, you know, I you you look at people like, you know, uh, there's loads of examples, and there's loads of people. Piff is a prime example, although he I realised was twenty years ago. Um, or you look at someone like Colin Cloud, who does who's done this, and even Bones, people like Magical Bones, who've done this morning and those sorts of things, makes a huge impact to their career because it gives them credibility that I just don't have. You know, well. On that, what's what's the end game? Because obviously, you're very successful at selling out uh, theatres. In in and you tour and you constantly tour and and crowds come back and more people are coming every single time. But it's a lot of hard work, like you said, a lot of hard work to do that. Like you got to be at the venue early. You're traveling back late at night, and then yeah. the stuff behind the scenes when you're not doing the show, liaising with the uh, with the theaters, making sure the t- the, t- the tickets aren't going to sell themselves. You have to make sure that uh, that happens. There's a lot of hard work involved in that. What's what's the end game? Are you wanting to carry on doing that forever? Have you got other goals that you would like to hit? Um, are you wanting to start doing international tours? Or like what what are your because I suppose the question I'm trying to say is here is you've achieved so much more. You're doing more now than, like I said at the beginning, what you're doing, most magicians would dream of doing. This is like the end goal for a lot of magicians and you're there and you've only just got started. Mm. What are your other bucket list items on your magical bucket list that you want to hit? Where else are you wanting to go? Or are you just happy like going, hey, 
I've got this. I've I've got a formula for this. This is working. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna carry yeah. on doing. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a formula for it as well, Craig. Like, the problem is, it is very intensive, right? What I would love is is Jimmy Carr's career. Um, the the reason I say that is he isn't m- m- like McIntyre, and he, as I mentioned already, he isn't he isn't even Copperfield, right? Copperfield goes and does the same venue twice a night with an hour and a half show, and how that man does it, I have no idea. No mm. idea. I'm sure he's a robot or something. Just I have no idea how he does it. But what Jimmy Carr will do is he won't do theatres bigger than three thousand seats, maybe three and a half thousand seats, and he will do two hundred show- shows a year. But also, more importantly, has control of the uh, like what he does effectively. Um, and then at, in his time off, he'll go and do telly. If I get an opportunity to do that sort of thing would love to do it um the problem is at the moment is i just have only have a certain amount of capacity so uh, in terms of brain power and those sorts of things so my my objective really is this is number one set keep selling bigger venues i want to move from 500 seaters to a thousand seaters really this year i've done a few i've sold a thousand at wimbledon a thousand at um a thousand at stockport and i did like set I sold out 700 and then 400 in the matinee in uh in Stafford which is a lovely venue so and and so I, that my plan is to do 1500 seater rooms um and then the the goal is really to make the ticket sales easier what you want is to be Ricky Gervais who can go right I need to new, put in some new material let's put in 15 200 seater theatres they will sell out like that goes and works in the material and then puts in a, a thousand seats theatre and then puts in a whatever. That's kind of what I want, really. I just want to grow the audience and make it, e- and it be easier to sell tickets. The thing with it is, you know, someone said to me the other day, how are you, uh, on a post about it, they said, how are you selling the seats? Is it advertising? I said, I really don't think you can sell out a theatre from advertising without a huge spend. You know, if you are, like, a, a prime example, I mean, I saw Time Traveller's Wife in the West End, uh, which had some stuff from Gareth Kalen and some stuff from Will Houston and the magic in it was amazing, amazing stuff. And and the show was really good, really, really good show. Loved the show. But, and they spent a, lo- a load of money on advertising it and it, they, it came down. I mean, the, Darren Singh in the West End is an example of that. You know, mm. um, unbelievable. Yeah. Because... It well, just, that that run was cut short. Very right? yeah, they knocked three months off it. Um, and so I don't think you can sell out a theatre just from advertising. You can only sell out a theatre from just blood and guts of building an audience over a long, long time. And I, I'm a bit worried of, and I'm a bit worried of what the longevity is of that. I'm not that worried. About it. I didn't. I don't need sleep over it. But at the moment, I'm on a rhythm. And I go, what happens if I take it? You know, whatever um so the objective primarily is sell bigger theaters sell them easier build an audience and also have better communication with them and by that i mean you know this sort of thing um you know i'd I'd love to have other things that aren't just one night at a theater i just am struggling with the capacity of managing a whole theater tour by myself (laughs) at the moment um but i would love to you know do that and then and everything else is a bonus tree but you know as i say you say you know this is what everyone would love to is what i wanted to is what i dreamt of my whole life and so you can't really people say what's the goal and you go well the palladium i suppose Mm. but it's also it's really weird how quickly it all gets normalized because what happens is now when i first quit my job I got myself an office in King's Cross because I thought I need to be somewhere where there's noise around. I'm not just sat at home. And I would drive in and and out. I, I used to live in Serpton at that time, which is about, probably about 45 minutes away to drive. And I remember driving past Westfield Shopping Centre and seeing a big bill. This is 2017 because it was when Ed Sheeran released Divide. Right? Uh, and I remember seeing a big billboard for Ed Sheeran's Divide. And it looked amazing. But I remember thinking to myself at the time, I went, he's not going to drive around the corner and be blown away by seeing that billboard because he's made all the micro decisions to get there that like he's seen that billboard coming for six months and has made a decision about that bit of artwork and that and that and also worked here and done that and and that and so that's the thing with the theater show is 
it doesn't feel any different now to how it did when I was doing 20 seats. It feels the exact same because I've like every single extra seat you're selling, you're working for. So it just feels like the same workload. I'm just able to sell more with the same workload, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So it is weird how normalized it gets. And, and what you said there is so true, you know, from a marketing point of view, the single most important thing is building up an audience, having a brand mm -hmm. uh, far and away above, above marketing. What have you, what, what's, you know, you, you, your brand is very, very strong. You know, people come back, you know, you're selling out these. Yeah. Yeah. What have you done to establish this brand? And, and a kind of a follow-up question as well is we don't often see you very often in the magic community. The reason I bring that up is because I see a lot of people that tour regularly mm. and I've gone and bought tickets to see them. And half the magician, half the audience are magicians. Yeah. You can just tell that a big part of their audience is the magic community because magician, you know, that's a community that are going to go and watch a magic show. Why would a magician not want to go and see a magic show? Whilst yeah. I think that I might be wrong, but I think a lot of the people that come to your shows aren't necessarily magicians. I know magicians do go, but I think that a big yeah. chunk is Yeah, the public. The public. I, like, I don't get many magicians at all, actually. I, I've had a few the last few weeks, but other than that, I, I, re I don't really, for a long time, I didn't get any. I get lots of sort of eight-year-old magicians that leave and, you know, they want to be you, which is really nice. Although I tell them I could do without the competition, so can you get lost? Uh, <laughs> but there's actually, interestingly, just, I know this isn't what you've asked, but I'll say this. There's lots of young girls, like eight, nine-year-old girls that want to be magicians that come to the show. And I just think it's lovely. Because they'll be far better than we are. Like, yeah. absolutely. They're much more approachable, much less seedy. Mm -hmm. Us wearing our spangly ties or whatever. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, the question was, how do you build your audience? Um, yeah. Your audience. And was it a conscious decision to not go after the magic community when you were building up your audience? I... Uh, do. It, it wasn't a conscious decision but kind of was. And this will be something that offends many people, but I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I wanted to join the Young Magicians Club when I was younger. I went to the Cardiff Circle Day of Magic uh, when I was 13 uh, because I had a girlfriend at the time. This is weird, I had a girlfriend at the time that <laughs> I met on a cruise ship that lived in Cardiff. Uh, but anyway, and uh, <laughs> I'm Mandy Davis was there uh, doing something for the Young Magicians Club and I, I hadn't met anyone before, I hadn't met Mandy before, I hadn't met any of those people before really um, and I remember leaving and saying I want to, to my Uncle Paul, I want to join the Young Magicians Club and he said don't do that, he goes you do you, you find out who you are and then join the circle um, and I kind of did that, I mean I joined the circle when I was 25 and I don't know, think, necessarily think that's the right way to do it but I do think it's easy to get your priorities skewed I was thinking about this. I listened to an interview yesterday that Laura London did and talking about being the librarian for the circle. And that is the power in the circle, I think. You can go in there and there is so much and you should dive into it and work out what you want to do and and those sorts of things. But I purposely didn't go too deep in the magic world when I was younger because I wanted to be me first. and then if that makes sense yeah um and I, i've suffered because of that because you know you look at people like darren who sit in a room with andrew o'connor and andy nyman and the whole show comes as a collaboration of those three minds and that's not something i particularly have and i miss because you know i'm i, I you know it, it's those things are super useful and collaboration is really important um, and also, you know, every time I've gone to a magic convention, I've seen the gala show, I've gone, oh, so good, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I wish I thought of that or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm conscious of, there's been people that have done big stuff and there's been people that have done stuff from Britain's Got Talent that I know I've had that conversation with them. They probably don't remember that conversation at some point, come up with an idea and they have an idea in their head. They don't know where it's from. And I go, why not? Cause I wrote that down five years ago. Um, and so I, for a long time, didn't want to accidentally steal other people's stuff as well. You know, I didn't want to it come to go to brainstorm the idea and go, I've had this really cool idea, right? You get a cup on a ball or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, like I, I just didn't want to come up with an idea that I genuinely thought was original that wasn't. 
Um, but, you know, that that's not necessarily the right way of doing it. Um, and, you know, the thing that I found was... Uh, the thing is, Craig, like, if you... If you I has how it sort of in depth I, I go with it. What happens is when you're moving quickly, when you start from ground zero and you you move and people are almost in terms of like they see you doing stuff that they want to be doing mm. um when they've been doing it far longer than you, you get a lot of hostility as well. So I purposely stayed away from that because I, you know, as I said, I mentioned to you before about Edinburgh is the most host there's been, there's magicians in Edinburgh this year who wrote fake reviews on my show saying stuff like, we get it, your uncle Paul was famous or something, or your uncle was famous or something like that. Bear in mind, the show was about me being IVF and nothing to do with my uncle Paul. Um, but they obviously hadn't seen the show. Um, there was also, you know, you also get, there's a, there's a magician who I, I shan't name, but I have seen a message going we didn't know who he was before paul died so he's probably lying about being anything to do with him and so you just go i that's fine yeah and they want to say that that's absolutely fine but i don't want to see it and so i can go and do my thing and feel good about it because i'm working towards something and it's coming off and you feel good because you're like oh I, I have control of it and that would ruin my week and so i just i i purposely stayed away from from that as well for a long time Whereas I'm I'm past that now. Like I I kind of I think I've I've earned my keep, and so I kind of just think whatever, you know. But for a long time I didn't want that in my brain because you know it, with the Edinburgh stuff particularly really really bothered me. Um, and you just think I can't do any more than I'm doing. And I just you know I'm not like that to you. So why are you doing it, Matt? Um, and so that that was a lot of it as well. That said though, you know there's loads and loads of people most people in magic are lovely and if i you know there's I, when I, I posted that thing the other day and which i, I won't sort of go into detail but i will say i had lots of lovely phone calls from lots of lovely people and i i do think any realm of showbiz and showbiz is the worst for it because it's on show you know yeah. if you're a dancer it's the same you know if uh, my my auntie tells me a lot she goes when she was at the royal ballet school people would break up glass and put them in her ballet slippers because she was a better dancer um and it's it, the thing with showbiz is you they can see what you're doing whereas if i was a, a company I, i'm in an office on my own so you don't have you don't see that so it's by the time they notice it's too late <laughs> you know by the time they go oh that's really annoying um and I, and I do think that's what it is. And I also think most people, myself included, you know, probably don't have, they don't go, well, this is making me feel bad because it's jealousy or or any of those sorts of things. But it, it's something that happens in every walk of life. I, you know, I remember Bonnie Langford talking about it. Okay, it's just professional jealousy. You know, it's something to do with her. Um, and so, and it's a funny game, showbiz. And it's fickle and it... Uh, it comes and it goes and it's transient and someone will be the, the herd as it were will be hostile to someone one day and lovely to them next and vice versa and it's it's very difficult to very difficult to sort of get your head around that and so that was something that i just thought no i'm going to step away from that because it i i don't, i no matter how much i do and and also you know the, the show's not for magicians right you know, yeah. I do it. I had Marvin Berglas in the show the other day and I did a Svengali pack in the show, which I hadn't touched for years. And I and I did it to kind of be to a proof point, I think. Not to prove point. I love Marvin uh, to be funny, but the audience loved it. And it's it, I just love that. Whereas if I did that to a group of magicians, they'd go, what is this? The audience don't have a clue. They've probably all got one in the drawer and never have looked at it. And the thing is, the, 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 the magicians that would say anything negative about something like that have probably never been on a stage, period, let alone selling out stages yeah. over and over again, night after night. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I think it's very, it, I think the core thing, and I, you know, I would get told off by my auntie for this the whole time, is going, stop looking at anyone else. You look at you. 
And when you do that, when you do look at you, and it's very easy for me to go, you know, I look at um, who's doing well. Like Ben, like, as I say, Ben Hart, I have so much respect for, and I love his show. But it's very easy to look at Ben, because I looked at Ben's show and go, oh, he's doing this, and he's doing really well. Oh, I could, but you, and then that would eat me, and it stopped me being successful. Whereas what happens is you realise the more you don't look at other people, how, like, what everyone else is doing has no impact on you whatsoever you know and yeah. then to be honest the opposite like when when ben shows the, i said this to you a minute ago but when ben shows doing well my show does well and when my show does well ben show does well because people go and see ben love it and then come see more magic and vice versa um and so yeah like i i just think i i also have for a long time really struggled with not looking at what other people are doing and then so i i, I had to sort of actively be a bit more sort of fo like I don't want to say I'm sort of self-focused but you know what I mean you're kind of not being distracted by what A and B are doing and just focus on you um and I think that's what a lot of people don't do I think a lot of people have, are very good at looking at other people and 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 also you know the other thing Craig is you know it takes a huge amount of different sides of your brain to do the job. You have to be creative and analytical and everything in between. And some people, uh, like, like people are all wired a bit differently. Um, and so, you know, some people are better at this and some people are, are better at that. And, and so you don't kind of want people looking and, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's really, it's really fascinating to see that because, you know, I, 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 I am rambling now, but I will say this is, you know, it's really fascinating when you go, there's the whole world of magic and I've spent so long coming up with these ideas and then something happens, you know, you, you show it to a magician and then it's elsewhere and you go, well, I, I did the work for that. And it wasn't work. I didn't sit down and write it out. I was thinking about ideas for six months and then that came to me like that in inspiration. And then you've got, that's a good idea. And, 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 uh, I, I, you know, I, the the summary of what I'm trying to say is I, I found it much more beneficial to look at myself and and not worry about what other magicians are doing. That's really great advice. Do, do, one last question on that: Do do, do you find? Because obviously, we've talked about the important thing when you're doing what you do is to build an audience mm. and uh, sell out. You know, if, if you're wanting to go on tour like you are, do you find it difficult that like, hey? <sighs> Social media is a great way to build an audience, but it's a double-edged sword because at the same time, a lot of the hate that might come in, it comes from social media, but it's also something that I imagine that you would need to use to a certain degree in order to mm. generate an audience in the first place. Like, how do you, how do you deal with the fact that like something that you use to build an audience is also the same thing that you, because it's very difficult to, ignore something when it's also a key part of yeah. your strategy to build uh, so yeah so i mean i i have thoughts on this too i spent a long time in the car so i think about all this stuff i missed an opportunity with social media i when i came out of marketing i had some really good relationships with people like lad bible and uni lad and uh, those other pages that are similar um they're probably the two most famous but you know there's a page called viral thread and, and pages like that i had really good relationships with them and I did a couple of videos for them. I didn't have, I hadn't done the work creatively to have the ideas. So I had a had a deal with one of those pages that go, we'll post you once a week. And I, that would have been a really good way for me to grow my audience because that was pre-TikTok, pre-Reels. Everyone was still posting photos of their dinner on Instagram. So it would have been a really nice way to grow an audience pretty quick. And I did one video where it was shot okay, but it was an awful lot of work. And I got a load of negative comments. And it put me off for a long time. And then the, that ship sails and you go, mm, it's gone. Um, I think with a lot of that, it's entirely uh, a distraction because I don't do TikTok on purpose. I will do TikTok, but TikTok, and I do a bit of TikTok, I suppose, but it's, uh, it's that is the consequence of an action rather than the action itself for me is that if I make something, if I, we do this interview, we've got two hours of conversation that if I cut that down into 30 second clips and put it on my TikTok winner, great. I'll do that by all means, but I won't be making content for TikTok. 
Um, and the reason for that is I don't think anyone cares. I, I There is a couple of ways to do social media really well. Max Fosh is a prime example of it. He sold out the Palladium based off his YouTube channel. And, uh, but that's taken him 10 years. And I, I was interested, I was having this conversation with him about it because I said, I said that. And he said, the thing with TikTok and social media where people get 2 million views is that it's like graffiti on a gantry over, an, over a motorway. Is people drive under it and they go, well, that's interesting, and then never see it again. And I just don't think you can sell anything from it, really. And 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 I also I really don't like, and this is maybe my ADHD some in some way, but I don't like being at the mercy of an algorithm. I don't want to spend all of my energy uh working out how to do something this week that that blows up and then they change something next week and I have to do the whole thing again. What I do want to do is very much invest in the audience and care about the audience and then they will come to you wherever you may be um you know like as i say jimmy carr's not worrying about a tiktok algorithm um and and uh that will if you have a really good relationship with an audience and they love you and more importantly, you give them value and they, you make them feel better about themselves and they look at you on stage and you, they go, I want to be like that. Or there's two options. They either have to go, I want to be like that or I see myself in that person. Like they're the only two options. Um, in my opinion, I am well aware that Jerry Sadowitz is a, a contradiction to that rule completely. <laughs> but uh, but then again, maybe they do see himself, themselves and maybe a lot of the people do agree with what he says. I don't know. Um, yeah, I went to one of his shows and I was thinking, well, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what sort of, who these guys are, but I, I, they have to either like you or want to be like you. And that, if the internet went down tomorrow, they'd still be there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, it's the same thing with, with anything is that if you think back to sort of the early 2000s, uh, it was the exact same thing. Google started creating adverts and people could get um, get ads on Google for like a, pen, a penny a click and they would go download my get like get fit quick guide 20 quid and they were making millions of pounds and then all of a sudden Google changed it and went nah and they all those people went out of business and um, there was another example I heard oh pop-ups for a long time everyone was generating leads from getting but like putting a pop-up on the website and people started abusing them and then all of a sudden no one had pop-ups anymore and it goes whereas if you've got a a, a environment if you've got an environment where the, you and the audience have a genuine sincere relationship none of those things matter they are the effect rather than the cause whereas i think what a lot of people do is look the other way and as i say the only contradiction to that that i can think of really is people like ksi or you know they're like uh uh, uh, Max Fosh, who Max Fosh puts out one video once every two weeks, and it gets it's a long form video that it it gets how many million people watching, and then they actually care about him, and then he puts something up, you know, to on his Instagram that goes, "I'm selling this," and it sells out immediately. But that's because they they care about him, they spent a lot of time with him, you know. Whereas I just think if you're scrolling through, and, and you know, I, I say that Furman's doing really well off his TikTok, so. You know, I, I'm I'm not necessarily right. I just that's just my my sort of perspective at the moment. No, it's 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 really interesting because yeah, I I I agree with you 100 percent on that. By the way, um, but there are a lot of people rushing to uh, you know rushing to it's shiny uh, penny. It, it's yeah. just shiny penny. It's it's people who made all the money in the gold rush are the people selling the shovels. Like like that's it is that it's it's the latest thing, and um. And I'm not saying there's no power in it because there absolutely is power in it. But I think it is too unpredictable to be my priority. You know, um, I, I want to focus on the stuff that I have control over and then do that stuff as the bonus once I've got all my ducks in a row. You know. Can I ask you one more question? Uh, yeah. This has been an amazing interview. I'm, I'm, I wasn't going to ask you this, but I'm really interested. 
I've spoken to a lot of people and COVID really messed them up. There's a lot of magicians that just quit the whole industry. Not yeah. just magicians, but so uh, uh, in showbiz, a lot of people quit over over lockdown and never came back. Mm. You obviously had a brand. You obviously had an audience before COVID. But from the outside looking in, it feels at least to me that your brand has become even stronger. There is a genuine reason for that, Craig, and it's a very deep thing for me to talk about, so I'm going to tell you all about it. Okay. Um, I, I said to you earlier about, um, you know, I, I, I missed the opportunity. With the I didn't do the YouTube channel and those sorts of things. So I was in a, I was in a relationship for seven years, right, with someone that I, I knew from school, and we lived together from when I was 21, and the whole thing was hell. And I was quite lucky that when I was 21 and I was at university and I decided I want to do magic before that, before that relationship, I knew exactly what I was going to do and how I was going to do it and had confidence in that I was going to do it. So I had a really good sense of self. And I was in that and the, the, the whole relationship would, it was very much undermining of all of that stuff, whether it be me personally or the career. But because I knew what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, I would put one foot in front of the other anyway, despite the fact I wasn't feeling good about it and just kind of moved slowly forwards. I didn't have the confidence to do the YouTube channel, those sorts of things because of that, to be completely frank. Um, and then what happens is uh, COVID happens and uh, the whole world gets turned upside down. And the first three or six months was 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 beneficial because when you're working every day, your brain doesn't have time to process and ferment. And the first three or six months is where all the ideas kind of all came together. And I went, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, but then after that, it wasn't fun for anyone. Uh, but that relationship ended during that period, basically because everything kind of came to a head. And then when the world opened up, I, it was just like a liberation it was like I didn't have this glass ceiling on me anymore like I, I didn't feel uh like I, I all my energy wasn't going into trying to find confidence for myself mm. and so uh all that's happened is it's like the the ceiling has come off uh, come off me as a, in the career or personally and then you just that you have this ability to flourish completely and you know it's hard when you're in something for a long time but you you know I learned that that you know good to not have toxic people and not have, no, I'm not going to say she's a toxic person but well, I have kind of implied that you know what I'm trying to say the environment yeah. is, it's better to step away from those things because it just despite the fact despite there's a loss and there is always a loss in those sorts of things um you it like it, it it's much healthier for everyone if you do what you know is the right thing to do and that the career is a is a prime example of that because everything that I'm doing now was in my head in those times. I just didn't have the emotional capacity or the confidence to be able to do it. Um, and that's kind of the the truth, really. Wow! And you can tell because genuinely, you 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 have skyrocketed since COVID, while a lot of yeah. people haven't. Um, you you really have, Thanks. and you can just see that from the outside looking in. Okay, I've got one final question for you because this has been an amazing interview. Genuinely, I've probably done about 400 interviews at this point, and this is my favorite. Genuinely, I've loved this. And I think part of the reason is, although we've known each other and yeah. I've known of you, I, I, I don't know you well enough to know a lot of the stuff that I'm asking about. So this has been really fresh and interesting for me as well. A lot of the people I interview, I kind of know it. So yeah. you know, I'm hearing yeah, yeah. it for the second time, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding so much out. It's great. One last question. For anybody who's watching this, that's a magician maybe, and they're they're a professional magician, they're a jobbing magician, they're they're going out and they're they're, they're full time, but they're they're not fulfilled, and they want to go and move from close up to stage, or they want to actually start doing theatre shows, and you could give them one thing to do now to start them on the journey to where you ultimately are. If there's mm. one thing that you would suggest doing. Not for somebody who's not done, not for a, a, a hobbyist. I'm not talking about hobbyists or uh, I'm, I'm talking about people that are going out, making a living. They're going out, they're paying the bills, but they're not happy with where they are and they want to move on. It might not be selling out shows. It might be something else. Mm. What one thing would you say that they could do now to take control of where they want their life to be? I just think everyone knows. I think you know what you want to do and you know what you should do. Yeah, you've got a little voice in your head that is normally right 
And if I do a show and people come off and they go, it was amazing. And my voice in my head goes, but it wasn't that good. Like I could have done that bit better. Like you're right. They just, like, and, and I think that's the same with anything. I think, you know, with my career is if I, if I followed my uncle Paul's career path, I would have hired a PR and then I would have hired someone to sit in the, in the ground floor of the BBC and ask people to put me on telly and I wouldn't have gone anywhere. But the, 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 the sentiment from that was no, no, the end goal and then write the steps in between it. And, and that's kind of it really. Like it's you, it's a very worthwhile thing to do to just, the thing that I've realized is that you can do just about anything you want. You just have to know how to do it. And I, that sounds far more easy to say than it is to do, but it, it's not, it's, you know, I know full well that if I, if I wanted to grow a, if I wanted to grow a TikTok page, as an example, I could ref- film a video every day, tweak it every day. And then at some point, those numbers were going to start resonating better with people or the videos start resonating with people and the videos would be the same. And it is just that it's just going, just be frankly honest with yourself about what it is you want. I I mean, I'm in no position to give this advice to anyone, but just be frankly honest with yourself about what you want to do. And then you'll be able to find a way. And, and that is, I, I, you know, I say this in the show, the new show, which is, as I say there, it's called the dreamer. Um, I talk about that a bit. Because I just realised if you have a plan B, it's always going to distract from the plan A anyway. So you just take the leap and you'll find your way along the way. It's part of the process. It's part of the fun. You know, anyone that's successful, you know, there's, a, there's an old thing about Bruce Forsyth. Is Bruce Forsyth did, I think it was the Bush Theatre, maybe? There was this season that was just brutal and he died every day. Every day he died and died and died and died and died. Uh, but it was doing that and tweaking it every day the process of of working it out along the way is what then made bruce brucey um Mm. and that and that's kind of what it is it's just it's i really just think there there is like you you kind of already know what to do and and if you don't know what to do you know what you don't know and then you find that out you know and then you just you fill in the gaps it's the same thing with with just about anything when you're writing a show you know where the holes are in the show and you go, I need something that fits there, but I don't quite know what it is yet. So go and find, and I don't do this nearly enough, but go find a book and write down ideas until you find something that fits that hole. And it's the same thing with life, I think. That's perfect. That's great advice and very, very true. And I have to say, James, I said it before, I'll say it again. This has been an incredible interview. And I, I, I it's one of my favourite interviews I've ever done. And I hope that people have listened to this um and i'll be honest i've never actually i've seen you perform on stage obviously i've mentioned it i think you're fantastic i've never actually uh i've never actually watched your full show and i think the first thing i'm going to do of coming off this is going to find out where you are next i'm going to come and watch it i you must but i really want the new you're in your midlands aren't you Mm. whereabouts are you uh near uh cheslin hay near litchfield i'm at litchfield garrett when may i'm there i'm there i'm there i'm bringing me Family, Ryland, uh, I, I really want to see your show. If people want to see your tour dates, yes, where can, where can they go? Where, where, where? Would uh, you find that's them? a good question because obviously the show is about to change. My Instagram is the place. So if you go to at feeling magician mm-hmm. and uh, P H E L A N magician, uh, the, whatever the tour is at the moment will be in the link in the bio. But um, you know that's the best place. You'll see me posting about it all the time anyway. Maybe. Feeling magician on yeah the other thing that's worth saying actually Craig because it, it this is I'm just about to sign the contract for this is the show's going into BAFTA's theatre in Piccadilly for six weeks in December oh congratulations that's uh, I'm very stressed about it so we'll hold the congratulations for another year <laughs> um, but that'll start in December so yeah I'd love to have a load of people come to that as well that'd be fab yeah, that's great so that'll be uh I imagine tickets will be on sale as soon as yeah, a couple of weeks probably. Brilliant. Okay, so look out for that as well. That's a great run. Christmas run, perfect. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Start on like the twentieth of December, I think. So it's you kind of you catch Christmas and then also hopefully Christmas people's Christmas present. Which is That's the plan. Perfect. That's perfect. James, congratulations on your ongoing success. Um, 
Uh, I didn't know Paul very well, but I knew him well. You know, I interviewed him, as you know, we spoke about that off camera. Uh, we chatted a few times. I went to his co a couple of his sessions that he ran in his home. Um, so I, I, I knew him a bit. And and from what I know, I I, I think he'd be very proud of what you've Thank achieved you. in the last few years. Those sessions were amazing, weren't they? I just, £100, go and sit and, I, I mean, I went to like two of them and I got so much value out of that. Yeah, I went to two of them as well. I mean, yeah. it's just unbelievable. He could have charged a grand each and would have, would have people, paid it. Yeah, it, I think it, he just did it because he lo genuinely loved helping people. I had a guy at the show yesterday who was a magician, said that uh, he was, you know, it was when my uncle was already on telly, but he was kind of a jobbing magician. And he said my uncle Paul rang him up and spoke to him. Like, he asked if he could. As in, the guy asked my uncle if he could get some advice. And my uncle rang him up and spoke to him for two hours and gave him advice. And I just think my uncle Paul loved Pete. He loved magic. My uncle Paul was the biggest lover of magic I've ever met, which is why it used to annoy people, uh, not annoy people, annoy him when, uh, you know, it would be misinterpreted or, you know, people would do stuff badly um, because he really genuinely loved the art form in every way and and wanted to uh wanted to, I like more than anyone I've ever met my uncle Paul loved magic you know he a lot of people are in it for lots of different reasons I I'm in it not for the love of the magic per se although I do love magic I'm in, in it for the love of the people but he really loved both those things and um that's why he was where he was he just he, he used to gorge on magic because he loved it so much and then you know, it means he when he was writing the shows, he had a load of stuff to pull on, and it's it's lovely. So yeah, thank you very much for saying that. No, it's it's very true, and I want everybody who's watched this to go check out the Instagram, go support James because ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, the more people that are out doing shows that are good shows that the audience are coming and watching and loving. It's great for the entire community because if somebody goes and sees your show, James, and goes, "Oh, I love magic." I'm going to get a magician with my wedding. That's going to benefit everybody. So the more support that we can show you and everyone else that's going out there and doing it, the more support that we can give to people like that, the better, because it's just going to be great for the whole community. It's going to be great. Yeah, and it's momentum, right? It's everything is, is if you're contracting, then it, it's going the wrong way. Whereas if, if it's like this, then there's more magic here. and more. It's just, it's good, better. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. So exactly, 100%. So everybody go and support James. Go and check out the Instagram. Go and follow me on Instagram. Go and I'm definitely going to the Garrick. It's literally just down the road from me. I'm one hundred percent going to be there. And uh, and I want everyone else to leave a comment down below. And I'm sure James will see it. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought of the interview. I thought it was absolutely amazing. But one more time, James, thank you so much for coming on the channel and congratulations for everything that you've achieved. You are an inspiration and Thank I very much. That. And congrats on everything with you, Craig. You seem to be just, I, when I first started to do magic at university, I bought your, it was like a billiard ball routine, oh, yeah, yeah. but you seem to just be like, you're, you're like a, a, a voice of sort of wisdom in when it comes to magic. I, I, you kind of, you're, I don't know, you're like the godfather, I guess. I don't know. I think I've just got old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. No, you're more than welcome. Genuinely, it's been an amazing interview. So, guys... Thank you so much for joining us on this interview. I will be back next Saturday with another Talk Magic, so make sure you check out that. And on behalf of James Phelan, thank you so much for checking out this week's uh, Talk Magic. I'm Craig, this is James, this was Magic TV, and we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.